Hey crew, before we get started today, I wanted to remind you that our live show from Convergence 2018 is now available on our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash E-I-S-T-P-O-D. It was a great show. We had a great time. We talked about the measure of a man, and we were so blessed and fortunate to have the writer of that episode, Melinda Snodgrass, on hand to answer all of our questions to uh, diffuse a couple myths as well. Uh, Find out if the internet is full of crap or not. Turns out a lot of those facts are true, and they make great stories, and Melissa did a great job telling them. So definitely want to hear this episode. You can get it at Patreon at patreon.com forward slash EIST pod for as little as one dollar a month to become a member of our crew. So check it out. On now to family with Jeff Lang. I had a great time talking to Jeff, as I always do. Always a pleasure to have him on the show. I will note that we had a little bit of a technical glitch in this show, and the audio quality isn't up to our usual Starfleet standards. But it's not a big deal. Uh, It still comes through. Jeff's humor and his warmth and his insights on a warm uh, and humorous and insightful show, Family, one of, I think, the best episodes of the fourth season of TNG. So here it is. Enjoy. Let's get underway. It's worked so far, but we're not out yet. I want to know what you're thinking. There are some things you can't hide. I want to know what you're feeling. Tell me what's on your mind. Hailing Frequencies Open, and welcome to Enterprising Individuals, the Star Trek discussion podcast that boldly goes into excruciating detail about the series, characters, and stories of the Star Trek universe. I'm your host, Aaron Coker, a.k.a. Caliban, and I, too, fight off the crushing pain of existence, the lie of self-determination, and the decay of my physical form by flexing and saying, I'm better. (laughs) I'm joined again on this episode by Jeffrey Lang. Jeff is the author of several Star Trek novels, including the two-part DS9 novel, The Left Hand of Destiny, the Section 31 novel, Abyss, which he co-wrote with David Weddle, and his most recent Trek work, the 2016 DS9 relaunch novel, Force in Motion. He's also had Star Trek short stories published in anthology form. Jeff, welcome back to the show. Thanks. Welcome back on board. Today we'll be talking about Family, the second episode of the fourth season of Star Trek The Next Generation, an episode that takes place within the shadow of the two-part episode, The Best of Both Worlds, in which Captain Picard is kidnapped and forced to serve at the pleasure of the villainous Borg. Best of Both Worlds is one of the show's most beloved episodes, and yet the full emotional impact of such a game-changing story would be lost without its quieter, character-focused follow-up, an episode that sees the minds behind Star Trek The Next Generation attempt to push the series to a place of greater emotional maturity. But We'll talk about that a little later in the show. Taking a bit of a left turn for a second, I know that you've worked in comics previously and that you worked for Comico in the 80s. Can you talk about how you got started with Comico? Oh wow! Oh, that is a that is a left turn. <laughs> um, uh, in the eighties, yeah, I worked at a. I was a. I was one of those guys who worked at a comic book store. Um, sure. And um, I was in my mid twenties. I'd just gotten married, and uh, my at that time wife and I decided that if <laughs> this sounds so ridiculous now to say about when you're in your but we decided that if we were going to make a move, like, 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 what are we going to do to, you know, get into what we want to do with, with our lives? I had been working in the comics world for a long time. Uh, I'd, I'd worked at this store for five years, which seemed like an eternity <laughs> at the time, which now feels ridiculous. But, um, and she was uh, a person who worked in higher education and we decided, okay, we're gonna we're gonna move to Philadelphia or somewhere in the Philadelphia area. And what other kinds of things could there be there that I could do? And I knew about Kamiko uh, or Comico. Com- that's adorable. They would they would have smacked you for saying that. Oh, Kamiko, excuse me. Kimiko, yeah. <laughs> and they were in the Philadelphia area, so I, I I I literally wrote them a letter with my hands. <laughs> not not something on a computer. I don't even know if I I must have used a typewriter. Um 
I just kind of said, this is who I am and this is what I do and this is my background. Do you have any, you know, would you be interested in hiring me or do you have any jobs available? And, you know, it was one of those crazy things where within a couple of weeks they wrote me back and talked to them on the phone and went and had an interview. And it was just, it was like, it kept, it was like this thing that kept happening. I kept going, this is crazy. I can't believe this. This is crazy. I can't believe this. And then I got there and uh, started working there and I realized, oh my God, comics industry is a shithole. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was actually, you know, in some ways a really, really enjoyable job, but it was extremely um, volatile. Uh, yeah. And uh, I, I don't know if you remember like the mid to late 80s in the comics world or if you were even around at that time. You probably were too young to remember this. But um, the independent market was kind of collapsing. Yeah. So it was pre-image. Um, the independent market was collapsing. The black and white boom that had made a lot of money for a lot of people was falling apart. And um, Comico was Kamiko was producing some really really good titles, but they were horribly overextended um, financially and you know in a lot of other ways. And it was just a very very chaotic and kind of crazy environment. But I got to be I I, I was just actually talking to a couple of my coworkers, still friends, uh, about this a couple of weeks ago. We were talking about, remember this book that we did when we were there? And it's like, <laughs> I still remember, there were some really, the Rocketeer. Yeah. We did Rocketeer. Um, we did some great, great issues of Grendel. And, uh, yeah, stuff I'm really proud of. Yeah. Very, very proud. How did you find out about that? Uh, I don't even remember. I was just um, looking around, I think maybe at a bio for you or something like that. And I was seeing, um, and also the, you know, the kind of comic stories that you've written and seeing, um, oh yeah, Grendel, Mage. I remember that stuff. The the Robotech uh, series. I like that yep. when I was yep. younger. Yep, yep. Yeah, those were good times. Or sometimes they were good times. <laughs> <laughs> I know too that like, you know, the whole problem with, or one of the many problems with the show that you call comics is that, uh, is that publishing is, um, kind of a nightmare. And of course, you know, diamond kind of has everybody, you know, locked up. And so you have a situation where like, where Kamiko's trying to publish themselves or like the whole hero's world debacle, you know, back in the day and everybody wants to, I think the, the way it's going now, if comics continue to be paper or they just go completely digital, it's just, you know, you have to deal with diamond if you, uh, if you want to be in the, the business at all, I have a couple of friends that run stores around town and they have endless stories about how horrible it is, the orders that they have to make that they don't want to in order to get yeah. you know, the, the comics just to keep going as a shop. Well, uh, you know, actually in defense of the distributors, a lot of that's dictated by the publishers. I mean, th yes, the, the fact that they have a monopoly and they didn't when I was in that business, there were five or six distributors. Um, a couple of them, which we really, I mean, as, as, at a, as a publisher, we really liked because they were people who loved comics, but by far Diamond was the, you know, the dominant one and they were business. I know a couple of people who work for them. It's a business. Yeah. Um, but it's really the publishers who, I mean, we could, we could go down this rabbit hole for a while if you want to. <laughs> uh, it's the publishers who really are the ones who put these, um, really on, I think unreasonable demands. On, in terms of, you know, if you want to get this cover, uh, you have to, pu you know, order this many. Or you have to order this many more than you did of the last issue, which is something I heard about Marvel recently, which, which just made me go, oh, my God, are you guys out of your minds? Yeah. So, yeah. We discussed the episode The Wounded when you were on the last show, which features the character of Captain Maxwell, played by Bob Gunton. And you have a pocket DS9 novel, Force in Motion, that revisits the character 20 years after the events of The Wounded. Why did you choose to take another look at Maxwell? That was actually an editorial suggestion. Um, that was, was I was pitching a, a story about Nog and Chief O'Brien. Um, having an adventure and I had a bunch of different ideas about well, what, what they were doing and where they were going and I had a lot of other threads throughout it and my editor at the time the, the Star Trek editor suggested that 
uh, we bring in a character that had been previously developed as somebody who O'Brien was you know, had had a relationship with, and you know that was that was talk, uh, that was the captain uh, Maxwell, and uh, it was basically her suggestion that we visit revisit him and find out what had happened to him. And I went back and re, you know I rewatched the episode and I thought, wow, this is fantastic, and I can't believe nobody has done anything with this character. Now I think I think we then found out later that somebody had done a little bit with him. Maybe it was Keith, Keith right. Candido. I don't remember. I, th- I think it was had had at least had a side reference to some bits of business with him in one of his novels, but it wasn't like a. And now here's where he is, and it just it just felt like a as as the as the development of the the plot um, unfolded, it just became more and more like yeah, this is a really interesting um, avenue. Uh, of something that they haven't touched on in any of the other books, they don't talk about in the in the in, the, in any of the series, except coincidentally, this one, family, <laughs> right? Is it's, it really? I, I was watching this and going, "Oh wow, it's this again." I'm really fixated on this. <laughs> <laughs> this PTSD. The, uh, I mean, I mean, it's a story about a guy who's got PTSD. Yeah. Yeah, Again, right? Um, and you know, it's not like as uh, um, acute. It's not as uh, uh, you know. It has a it has a better ending because he got treatment and he had you know resources and all that other stuff. But as I'm watching this, I'm thinking, oh right, that's right. This is the episode where Picard is kind of you know at his lowest ebb. I mean, was there ever a point where he was at a lower ebb than this? I don't it, think so. It's hard to remember. Yeah. Maybe when he was being tortured yeah. uh, in the um, oh right, right 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 yeah 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 but that was a little different I yeah. this was just this was just him doubting himself mm-hmm. um and that was that was really interesting uh, so yeah uh, I was I, I as we as I was watching this I was like okay here I am again we're back with uh, <laughs> you know <laughs> this problem so uh, I don't know if that's a coincidence or something that I have some sort of um, fascination with, but really, when you ask me, you know, what would you like to do, or what episode would you like to talk about? This is the one that came to mind, and it wasn't because of the PTSD angle, but just the um, the the atypical tone mm-hmm. of this story, and and the fact that it is, you know, however many years later now, it is one of the ones that I remember kind of fondly for its sort of rambling tone. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, it's not plot. Well, it is plotless. It doesn't have a plot. Not really. Picard goes on. He visits his brother. Yeah. Worst parents come and visit. Wesley gets a message. Those three things have nothing to do with one another except what is in the title. Right. That's it. Yep. Um, except that it's also an epilogue to Best of Both Worlds. Right. Which is something that they almost, I don't remember, it, uh, you probably know better than I do. Have they, did they ever do in, in Next Generation an epilogue story? I think they may have in Deep Space Nine at some point or another. I can't say for a fact. That's just sort of structurally the kind of thing that they would be more willing to do there. Right. But certainly not in any of the other series. It's mostly just, you know, we've got that problem resolved, hit uh, warp one, engage, and let's get out of here. And this one, they were like saying, they were saying, this is, this is, we can't just start over again. We can't just hit the button and, and go to the next episode. It would be, um, it would be under, it would be, uh, what's the word I'm trying to think of? It would be under playing what the impact of what happened here. Right. This is, this is our hero. This is the, the you know, this is our captain. He was brought low. And we can't just ignore the fact that he is, he has been damaged. Right. Um, and that is amazing. I think, I mean, and a credit to the writers. And I have to ask you, you were doing the introduction to this. You were saying this was the second episode of season four or was it season three? I'm season four. I'm unsure. It was season four. Okay. So season three ended with best of both worlds. And then season four began with part two. That's right. 
they had some confidence at this point that they could do this. Yeah. I mean, I was, I, I, that would be my guess is, is that before season four, they probably wouldn't have attempted to do something like this. Oh, it's yeah. too weird. And the writer of the episode, uh, Ronald D. Moore, uh, received a lot of pushback about just even the concept of an, of a show like this, um, from Gene and from mm-hmm. some of the, um, the higher ups and the writing staff, which, we will uh, absolutely dive into um, in a little bit. I wanted to say really quick that at the end of The Wounded, O'Brien and Maxwell sing a song together called The Minstrel Boy. At the end of this episode, Picard and Robert sing a French folk song called Après de mes Blondes. Coincidence? Do you only want to talk about episodes where tough guys hash it out in song? <laughs> oh. I do remember, I, I, I did hear the, I watched the episode today and I, I heard the song they were singing, and I was like, oh, I recognize that from high school French class, but I don't oh, remember okay. the name of the song yeah. or, or what, it, what it is about. Do you know what it's about? Oh, only very obliquely. Um, it's about a guy – like the chorus is like he loves sleeping next to his girlfriend, and I think the subtext is that he is like a prisoner somewhere. It's kind of like an Orange Blossom special type uh, type song, like a John, oh, John Cash okay. type song. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, but it's such a cheerful tune, though. Yeah, right. Exactly. That's odd. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, a song that you would sing, well, I guess, you know, some you would sing with your brother. Um, but it, I, I loved, I mean, uh, well, I loved that part of the story after they, were, they, were, they had their fight and they were just like, well, we can talk about that later. <laughs> yeah, um, yes, we'll, we'll, we'll get to yeah, that for sure. We'll get to that. Uh, I wanted to say uh, that this is, of course, uh, the Next Generation episode, Family. It's the second episode of the fourth season. It first aired on the 1st of October in 1990. It was written by Ronald D. Moore, who I think at this point on the show were safe just yada, yada, yada uh, You know who Ronald D. Moore is. Yeah. Um, although yeah, yeah, yeah. elements of the episode, in particular the Jack Crusher subplot, were taken from a spec script submitted by Suzanne Lambden and Brian Stewart. Lambden is a fantasy mm-hmm. author. Uh, she had a job at Paramount at the time, and Stewart worked in the Paramount mailroom. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And, uh, That's great. A- apparently uh, Stewart's, uh, Stewart's father had died um, at the time uh, recently, and he approached Lambden with a story idea about Wesley getting a chance to speak to his dead father, and they developed a script called The Wish. Uh, and those story elements were bought uh, to put into family. Let's just touch on that That subplot for a minute. Well, you know what? We're not even going to call it a subplot because as we've agreed, this story has no plot. Right. It is a series of, of incidents. Whoever it was who decided to not make that an entire episode and just make it, a what is it? It's three scenes mm-hmm. in this episode. It's got to be what? A whole total of six minutes? Bravo. Right. It, it, it's, it's so well done. It has such a light touch it it treats uh, Beverly and Wesley with so much respect, mm. and it doesn't choke you with sentiment, which would have been, I think, um, in the hands of lesser writers. And I don't mean that to say that about the people who the spec script. I, I we don't know what what how they would have done this. I'm just saying right. the way they treated that story that epi- that 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 story in this episode was so well done. Yeah. it was one of the episodes I remember from seeing it when when at 1990 whenever it was on. Like, oh, I like Wesley, and those moments were hard to come by. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you know, no. I mean, he got to be a better and better character as as time went, and I think by the fourth season, he was actually a very engaging character. Yeah. Um, but to but to have him, um, you know, he came across as being very sympathetic and very uh, mature mm-hmm. in his response to this whole thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I really, really liked that the restraint. Restraint was not something, let's be honest about this, restraint was not something that the early Next Generation episodes came by easily. No. <laughs> so, um, you know, and it, and it doesn't, and also, this is the thing, it doesn't feel wedged in. I would say that it's sort of like, and I mean this in a good way, but it's kind of like uh, good packing peanuts, <laughs> you know, like it's clearly not, yes. it's not the A story, but if you did need something else to sort of fill out the backdrop of what's going on, uh, it does fit in very nicely. And it's a nice little grace note. Yes. Yes. Uh, it's a good, har- it has a good harmony with the other two stories because one of them is a story about 
um, a bro- two brothers. Mm. The second is um, a troubled son and his parents. And the third one is a troubled parent and his son, right. who's based fundamentally okay. Yeah. And how and how those and, and, and then how those three relationships, how each of those you know, people who has been wounded is healed. Right. Because it isn't Wesley who's wounded in that scenario. It's it's actually Jack Crusher mm-hmm. who's the one who is saying, Well, I'm you know, I'm your dad and I'm not really too sure about what I'm doing yet, but da 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 and and the thing I felt like Wesley kind of I mean, he said goodbye. Yeah. He closed the chapter. He said, I'm, this is, this is over. Yeah. It's just lovely. I mean, you know, Will Wheaton, you know, did a fantastic job who, I'm sorry, I don't know the name of the actor who played Jack Crusher, but he was, he was really good. The episode was directed by Les Landau, who's a veteran director on the franchise. Uh, the star date for the episode. I thought so. Yeah. The start date mm-hmm. for the episode is 44012.3. And because we're on furlough this week, uh, let's just say that you don't have to give us a 25-word synopsis. I feel like you've already um, summarized the episode uh, very well. Oh, I didn't know that was a requirement. Okay, fine. I will, I'll, become, I'll become prepared next time. But uh, <laughs> Yeah, I think I did. Yeah, it's a non. It has no plot. It's about healing. <laughs> That's correct. Yeah. Uh, on the subject of Wesley interacting with that hologram of Jack Crusher, um, that scene was actually cut down from what was originally shot in the uh, Blu-ray. There's an extended version of that scene, and Crusher talks about um, the uh, Crusher family and some of Wesley's ancestors. Uh, how he had a grand- great great grandfather that was an artist. Um, one of his ancestors was a horse thief on Nimbus Three. Uh, which is, of course, a reference to Star Trek V. And he had four bears that fought in the Battle of Bull Run and at uh, Station Salem 1. That is nice. I mean, I, I, I could live without it, but that's a, that's a nice bit of business. Yeah, that's one of those things that, that gets cut. But at the same time, yeah, it is, mm-hmm. it, it's a nice little uh, background thing for Wesley. Family is the first TNG episode that features no scenes set on the bridge. Uh, liaisons and dark page would be the other two bridgeless episodes it's in this episode that chief miles edward o'brien gets a full name and his rank is identified Mm -hmm. as chief petty officer for the first time and apparently a condition of rick berman agreeing to this episode was that it contain a sci-fi plot in some way so at one point it was proposed that wormholes on the ship would be causing people to disappear uh, eventually, Cooler Heads prevailed and they dropped that idea, but it was resurrected for an upcoming episode called Remember Me. That's the one with uh, where Dr. Crusher is trapped in a, in a warp bubble. It is also the only episode that I think I remember that doesn't have any scenes with data. That's correct. Is that right? Okay, good. I wasn't sure if that was if there was maybe one other one where, you know, Brent Spiner was sick or something like that. But he was notably absent. Yeah. And if I recall correctly, it's because the next episode after this is the one where he be, has to play like three roles. Right, he is does that, is that correct? Or? Yep, it's brothers. Yes. Oh, he has to be Lore and Data. Yeah, and uh, Nudie and Soong as well. Yeah. Oh, right, of course. So, yes, they gave him a day off. They gave him a week <laughs> off yeah. so he could <laughs> do all that makeup. Boy, uh. <laughs> Uh, Robert gives Picard a bottle of Chateau Picard at the end of the episode, and we see that bottle again in the episode First Contact when Picard shares it with Chancellor Durkin. And uh, you wouldn't know this, not watching Discovery, but Captain Giorgio of the USS Shencho has a bottle of the 2249 vintage Chateau, Chateau Picard in her ready room. Ooh, nice. Uh, yeah. 2249. Good year. Oh, good year. Good year. Right. <laughs> uh, we, met, we were talking about guest stars before. You know, the quality of an episode, is, especially on episodic TV, is often set by its guest stars. And this episode features a murderer's row of talent. Uh, Jeremy Kemp stars as Robert Picard in the episode. He was in a number of World War II films in the 60s and 70s, including The Blue Max and A Bridge Too Far. Uh, he also played King Leontes in The Winter's Tale on BBC TV, and he would play Cornwall with Laurence Olivier's Lear in the 1984 TV version of King Lear. Samantha Egger plays Marie Picard in the episode. Egger was nominated for an Academy Award for her performance in the 1965 film The Collector. She also won a Golden Globe for that performance, and she was named Best Actress Mm. at the Cannes Film Festival. 
Uh, Edgar also played Mary Watson in The 7% Solution, the Sir Sherlock Holmes film written by Nicholas Meyer based on his novel. And Jeremy Kemp was... Woo-hoo. Yeah, Jeremy Kemp was in that film as good well. Good film. Good film. Yeah, that's a good yeah. film. And she's also made plenty of TV appearances, and she continues to work as a voice actor to this day. Theodore Bikel plays Sergei Rosenko. Bikel may be best known for playing Sheriff Mueller in the 1958 film The Defiant Ones, although he has appeared in other classic films like The African Queen and My Fair Lady and The Enemy Below. And he's also made many television appearances on shows like The Twilight Zone, Mission Impossible, and Babylon 5. And, of course, Georgia Brown plays Helena Rojenko. She would reprise the role in the fifth season episode, New Ground. She was an accomplished singer and actress. She got her start on the London stage, and she originated the role of Nancy in Oliver. She appeared in films throughout the 60s and 70s, including The 7% Solution. And she would continue to work on Broadway and the London stage until her death in 1992. So that's three people so far we've got who were in the 7% solution from this episode. Also notably uh, uh, worse parents, uh, maybe not surprisingly, considering the performances that they gave, were well known for playing in uh, Yiddish theater. Yes. Uh, in, in particular, playing, I, I'm not sure what the roles were. I think it's Tevye and his wife in Fiddler, Fiddler on the Roof. Yeah. Shocking, right? Well, you get that kind of, <laughs> yeah, there's that tone. <laughs> <laughs> and I think the production was a little worried about that uh, sort of connection. Like they they didn't want the audience to think that they were suggesting that they were Jewish. But it's like, yeah. who cares? I mean, you know. Who cares? Yeah. yeah. They were fabulous. Let's talk about them. Yeah, absolutely. I love them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I adored them. And um, again, uh, I think the, 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 um, how well modulated. I guess we're going to have to give some credit to the actors, but also maybe perhaps to the director. Um, both of those characters, I think, in the first, and, and, and you know, they, you, you, you and I know they don't film these things uh, linearly. No, so no. It's, not like, it's not like, oh, the first scene feels a little overdone, but then they got better as they went along. Of course, that's not true. Right. Um, but the first scene that I, I, when I watched it, the first scene that they came on, I was like, Oh, this is going to be too much. I don't remember this being so broad, but then you kind of, I feel like I settled into the rhythm of the episode Yeah, and just was like, Nope, love it, love it, love it, love it. The other thing though, that really let me settle into the whole Worf story with, with his parents was how much fun it looked like Michael Dorn is having. <laughs> he is having such a great time. He's, 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 he always plays things a little bit broad. I mean, that's, I mean, let's face it, that's part of his character, yeah. but there's something that he gets in the interaction with those two actors that he seems to enjoy so much. Um, being giving a little little a little nuance a little bit of note of yeah i'm your son i'm yeah but and i'm the klingon warrior and all these terrible things have happened to me make me some blood pie mom please <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> you know it, it's just <laughs> <laughs> he really 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 seems to be having a good time right so that was that was my that was the main note that i made for myself um um, when I was when I when I was uh, jotting things down, Michael Dorn is having so much fun, yeah. and his and his and his interactions with the other characters, with with uh, with Jordy when his dad is like going on and on and on, and he's kind of like, oh God, please stop embarrassing me, and then he kind of relents because he like he loves his dad, right? And he's going to let him do what he wants, you know what what will make him happy. Okay, fine, go ahead, go with. Go with Jordy. Yeah. Mom and I are going to go, you know, yeah. to their Arborea, the Arboretum or whatever it was that they were going to go do. Yeah, that was fun. And there's a line from Worf that's something like uh, he's talking to Jordy and he's like, just give me a call when you – I mean when he's ready to, to – when he's done or whatever. Yeah, 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 yeah. It seemed like he was going to say like, <laughs> when you get sick of him, just let me know. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Yes, that was great. I think the depth um, that they have in their portrayal is great, too. Also, like the script, uh, like you said, is that they're not just like, here's Tevye and Hoddle come from, you know, Planet Fiddler on the Roof. Like, they are sort of, you know, goofy a little bit, but there's a reason that they're there. You know, they're there to support him. They know about the discommendation. And the episode gives you these little flashes, too. Like, he pulls Jordy aside 
And we don't even see what he says, but we know that he's going to say to Jordy, like, is he okay? Like, how's, how's Worf doing? Yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, props to Whoopi Goldberg. Uh, again, a person who sometimes can play things a little bit broad. She, she again, restraint. Mm -hmm. That story about, um, you know, talking about prune juice and, you know, what is it he's look, what is it Worf is looking at when he looks out that window? I mean, it was a great piece of writing. So she must, but she could have masticated that and she didn't. No. She kept it light. She was, she was subtle. It was, it was, it was really lovely. And it's one of those little (laughs) moments where that you don't get a lot of on next generation. Little little kind of heart. Oh, that's so sweet. Oh, that's so nice. You know, where you really get a sense of, you know, where Worf is coming from. Um, so that was lovely. Absolutely. I really enjoyed that. You mentioned uh, the actor that played Jack, Jack Crusher before. Uh, his name is Doug Wirt, and he also reprises the role in Violations and Journey's End. I believe that he plays uh, Jack Crusher at that age um, for every episode that Jack Crusher's in on TNG. And then, of course. Oh, wow. Yep. Uh, and then, of course, we've got David Tristan Birkin, who plays Rene. He would also go on to play young Picard in the season six episode Rascals. Birkin is the son of screenwriter mm-hmm. Andrew Birkin, who wrote The Omen 3 and Name of the Rose, and he's the nephew of actress and singer Jane Birkin. Did he do any acting after these couple of episodes? Because I don't recall ever seeing that name I subsequently. Don't I mean, no, I don't believe so. Um, I th- glanced at his IMDb page, but I can't remember what I saw now, but I don't think I saw a ton of credits. Yeah, but, it, but nothing that jumped out yeah, at you. Yeah, right, okay. Right. He, had, he had a nice presence. Um, the interaction with him and Picard at the very beginning of the episode where he says, Oh, you're my nephew. Yes. <laughs> and my favorite little bit there is that Picard just kept that going. Yeah. He didn't ever, he didn't overthink it. He just was like, Oh, okay. Uncle so just all through. And it was very sweet. And, um, you remember when they used to uh, portray Picard as somebody who couldn't like tolerate children. Yes. He, he was very uncomfortable around children. He was very uncomfortable around children, and yet this episode, I think, is the first time where he just had this very casual, low-key... I mean, it was a relative, so, of course, that makes a difference. But it's not like he's ever met this kid before. He hasn't been home in 20 years. Yeah. So, um, you know, this is his first encounter with with this this boy, and uh, they had such a nice, um, pleasant... Interaction chemistry, uh, I, it felt it felt very natural, like like an uncle, like you do, right? You know, right. I'm, I don't know if you're an uncle, but that's what you do, or if you're lucky, that's what you get to do. It's very it's very pleasant. You mentioned before that, of course, they don't make these things, you know, one right after the other in uh, TV episodic TV, and this was written and filmed well after the best of the bo- uh, the best of both worlds, of course, um, with best of both worlds. Oh, being, I didn't know that. Yes, being the end of the uh, season three, um, the cliffhanger, and then of course coming into season four, Michael Pillar actually. Uh, who wrote Best of Both Worlds, suggested in a note at the end of his script for Best of Both Worlds that they should do an episode about Picard recovering from this experience, uh, which, of course, would be, as we've said, a departure for the series. And um, Pillar experienced a lot of pushback from the production due to the fact that, you know, this is not a a serialized show. And so he had to kind of work Mm -hmm. to convince Rick Berman that they should um, explore that. Um, Continuity or the lack thereof in Trek has been a sore spot, I think, for many fans and writers that worked on the show. Do you think that early versions of the show, like the original series or even, you know, TNG as it is, would have been improved by introducing more continuity? No, the television was a different creature in the 60s and 70s. And I, I you know, in the 80s, I was there. Yeah. I remember, um, you know, you didn't necessarily uh, know when the next episode of something was going to be on or if you did know were you actually going to be able to, to watch it if there were no dvrs there were no <laughs> vcrs or anything else i mean it, there, there were reruns so that meant until something went into syndication which we all as we all know ended up being a great virtue uh, or a benefit for star trek yeah um there was never any way to know now the interesting thing, okay. We, we, the interesting thing and, and the fascinating thing about Star Trek, the original series, is, is that the writers and producers actually did have 
some level of internal continuity. They did have some level of stories developing and, um, you know, if not in the sense of plot lines unfolding, then at least relationships building. Yeah. Which I think also Next Generation did extremely well. They, they had syndication. It wasn't the same thing. But even, I, I, if, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think by the end of the, their seven-year run, it was just the beginning of people being able to buy um, VHS easily. I mean, without you know, being able to like go to a store and say, oh, I would like to buy you know, these episodes of, of this series, but they were still expensive. Yeah. And, uh, and they do the thing where my memory. they'd have like, um, like a tape or a two tape set and it would have like four to six selected episodes. They wouldn't have like a whole run. Right. Right. So even then it wasn't like, we're going to give you the whole, you know, season of, you know, season four of next generation. And it's going to be a story because now we can give it. No. Uh, so I'm fine. I'm fine. I would I and but they did do a great job of as the series progressed next generation of giving you two parters and then extended stories that were built upon previous major episodes. I think the primary ones being the Worf arc and the Data arc. Sure, sure. Would you am I? Am I missing anything there? I mean, I'm sure there was some stuff with Picard and other characters, but those are the two major arcs. Yeah. The Klingon War and the resolution thereof and the discovery and, um, you know, explication of, of Data's origin. That and, um, yeah. And then there were also sort of abortive attempts like um, having uh, Sela, uh, you know, the Romulan... Um, uh, daughter oh, right. And that didn't, that kind of bombed yeah, out. Didn't yeah. It? yeah. 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 Um, but that was fine. And, and for the time it was actually very sophisticated. What else was there in that era? I mean, it wasn't until, and I'm going to betray my meanings here. It wasn't until we got to the X files, maybe. Yeah. That they actually started doing real serialized arcs. Yeah. It was very and selective was, though. Cause that was like five years later. Yeah. Well, yeah, it was, yeah, it was about mm-hmm. the same time. X files had the, the sort of virtue or at least plan of, you know, we'll do five or six ones where they're going after fluke man or whatever. And then we'll have one that's a, a mythology episode. And so I don't know. I think maybe Star Trek could have benefited from something like that. No, I have no idea what their ongoing plots uh, would have been, uh, but they were kind of yeah. without stating their intent. They were doing that in a way with, like you said, um, episodes like birthright and exploring, you know, Worf's connection to the Klingons. And, you know, they were sort of doing that. They were, and nobody else was doing anything even close to that. Yeah, right. And then, and then they got to Deep Space Nine, and even that was for the first couple of seasons sort of episodic. And then they realized, oh wait a minute, we have this group of people who. Oh wait, what else was there? There was Babylon Five that came in the middle of all of that. Right. And at that juncture, I think people realized, wait, we've got them now. They are watching us every week. They have VCRs because that's about the time I got a VCR. Right. <laughs> and so we can start telling long form stories. Um, and I think, I think um, Next Gen missed that window just because of the, the time and the technology. But also, I think it was probably something about the, the, um, the fact that it started out, it was a big success. Right from the get-go. I mean, financially, maybe if not artistically, but at least financially, right from the get-go, it was a big success. Yeah. And they didn't want to mess with that too much. Sure. It was yeah. when they got to Deep Space Nine and to a lesser extent Voyager that they were willing to um, play around with the formula. But they actually, well, anyway, with Deep Space Nine, let's just leave Voyager out of it. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, yeah. Uh, and now, of course, what they're doing with Discovery, which is, uh, as you tell me, is com- completely uh, long-form story, which is oh, yeah. fantastic. Yeah, It's probably no surprise or not surprising to hear that Gene Roddenberry hated the idea of this episode. Uh, in an interview with Trek Corps, Ronald Moore said that he and Berman and Michael Piller had brought the script to Gene, and Gene said that the story was, you know, it was, it was terrible. It said terrible things about Picard's parents. He said that the brothers would never have uh, this kind of animosity between each, each other and that it's not Star Trek. And tellingly, 
that there's no action in it and there's no jeopardy in it, which I would flatly disagree with. When you have a character, you know, your main character, and he's wondering whether he should start hanging out in Atlantis rather than going back to the Enterprise, it's like the whole show, the whole show's in jeopardy. <laughs> Of the kind of jeopardy I think that um, Gene understood, right. or at that juncture, yeah. is willing to acknowledge. Yeah, it just wasn't where his head was at at that point. I mean, this was coming to the. This was pretty close to the end of his life, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, it was about a year before. Yeah, you know, let's let's give him the benefit of the doubt. Um, and again, he was from a different era. Mm. Uh, you know, as sophisticated as next gen was in a lot of ways it was still being built on the bones of a much older kind of storytelling yeah and so so credit to everyone who managed to squeak this one by uh yeah. <laughs> um <laughs> I, I maybe I, and what does it say at that juncture that they could actually have said to gene well you know gene um <clears throat> we're gonna do it anyway okay yeah i don't i don't know if they even said that because uh, in, also in that same article, they're talking to Iris Stephen Bear, and he's talking about writing the episode uh, Captain's Holiday. Uh, and his original idea for the episode was that Picard would go to Risa and there would be like a holodeck like game there where you could face your greatest fear. And Picard's greatest fear turns out to be uh, being promoted and losing the Enterprise. And Gene didn't like that. He was like, ah, no, Picard doesn't fear anything. If it's time for him to grow old and become an admiral, he's going to become an admiral. He's John Wayne. And they pointed out that John Wayne had fear and guilt and anger in all of his movies. Mm -hmm. And he's like, nope, nope, John Wayne's a hero. Picard's a hero. We're not going to do this. And so they left the meeting. They left the meeting and they just went to Iris Even Bear. Just, just write it. Just write the episode. We'll, <laughs> we'll figure it out. Don't worry about it. <laughs> yes, and it was one of the best ones. Yeah. It's really, yeah, it's a good one. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's there, a good one. There's a lot of talk about captain characters and that they always want to hold on. They always want to be, you know, captains and masters of their own destiny. And they never want to get promoted because they wouldn't be able to command a starship anymore. Can you see Picard finally giving it all up and retiring to make wine or working on something like the Atlantis Project? It's a trope. I think you're right. I think it's something that they like us to believe. Um, you mean dangling something out in front of like a character, like they're going to take it, but we know they're not. Yeah. And, and, and also the idea that, you know, it's a mistake for these particular characters who we are, there are heroes ah. to um, <clears throat> consider being promoted and moving into a different role. Um, they did it again in uh, what was the last, Star Trek Beyond. They did that again. Uh, yeah. They 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 dangled that in front of Kirk, and then he was like, "Well, but what's the fun?" You know. Yeah. Blah, yeah. Blah, blah, blah. And I and I and I and I think I think it's a, a I think it's a lovely idea that um, we would like our heroes to just constantly be the people that they are when we first encounter them, and that they would be content being these role models. Yeah. And it's it's something that I think a lot of us feel like we get some comfort from it. Yeah. But realistically, I don't think it's I think it's something I think that the, the the that world and that universe would be better served by people like Picard taking their experience and their wisdom and, you know, in some form or another passing it on. Now the problem here is, is that even within the Star Trek universe, which is about the most optimistic universe I think we've ever seen in you know, popular fiction, anybody who leaves the captain's chair is automatically becomes a bureaucrat. <laughs> yeah. And nothing good happens. Nothing good happens to them, uh, which is um, it's probably unrealistic. Uh, but it's an idea that we would like to believe. Yeah. Um, it's certainly something that they started in... Um, Wrath of Khan, you know, with Admiral Kirk. I never should have left. Oh, and uh, Generation. They really hammered that home. That whole thing of, um, you know, oh, I never should have left, you know, the bridge of the Enterprise. Yeah, you know, right. and if they ever if they ever try to get you to leave that seat, don't let them. Right. <laughs> uh, uh, I mean, it's a it's a lovely idea. I think it's probably from from their perspective an audience and piece of fiction. Um, a good idea, but hey, you know what? Maybe there's a, a story to be written out there about a really effective admiral. Sure. You know, a guy who becomes an animal and 
everybody, everything in the universe is better for it. I, I don't know. That's something about. Yeah. But there's an equilibrium that fans, you know, and an audience sort of expects because, or at least they think they want. I mean, a great example yeah. would be, you know, in Force in Motion, you've got like a brand new station and Chief O'Brien, this is 10, 15 years on now. And here he is, he's chief engineer. Like he would never want to do anything else like with his life. <laughs> Yes. And, and yes, the world is a better place for Chief O'Brien being chief engineer. He's no longer the guy in the transporter. The transporter room. guy, right. <laughs> the world the world is a better place because he advanced and and grew. Um I think it's just most of us can't imagine that there would be anything better or more effective that we could do with our lives than be the captain of the starship. Sure. And the truth of it is is probably there is but I can't think of it. <laughs> I mean, honestly, I can't, you know, I'm, I'm having a hard time managing what that might be. Well, um, it, it'd be the Atlantis project. Clearly. I, speaking of Atlantis, clearly, I, I can't see any way that this is a good idea. Like, what are we doing here? We're going to make a no, new continent. What? A terrible idea. <laughs> a new subcontinent. Yeah. That was like, uh, I, I was like, why? What would what would be the benefit of that? I, right. You know, I mean, you have all of space to go through, To Why would you want to? And Picard talking about it like, well, it'd be like exploring a whole new world on our own planet. Like, no, it would be like a lot of rock rising up from the ocean bed and coral. And yeah. It would be slimy. <laughs> Who would want to go there? Right. I love that at one point, yeah, no. uh, again, here's a little continuity, but Picard says, oh, yeah, we used uh, resonance waves to change the topology of Drama 4. And it's like, uh, yeah, OK, I remember that episode, but maybe you shouldn't brag about your little prime directive violation. I don't think that's going to help. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't let, let's, 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 let's set that aside. <laughs> and he didn't. Louis, de, Louis didn't know that it was a prime directive yeah, he doesn't violation. Know about that. He was just like, I'm, oh, oh, that sounds really impressive. I always wonder what it's like to actually live on Earth in this century. Century, Like, you know, there's vineyards, clearly. We've got Cisco's. Uh, but we know that, like, regular people live there. But with what you'd have to imagine is a huge human diaspora, what's it like to be an Earthling, like to be from Earth in this century? That is a very interesting question. Uh, actually, I think one of the things I liked about writing Force in Motion was that a big chunk of it did take place on Earth, uh, and it was about people who lived there and were perfectly content to be there. Hmm. It's probably a very nice planet. Yeah, um, people are well taken care of. Uh, you know, it's not it's not it's not perfect, probably, but um, yeah, people have people have a pretty good way uh, lifestyle there. Um, <clears throat> all that aside, uh, I did love the, um, the shots of the vineyard and the fact that they obviously shot parts of that on location. Mm -hmm. Holy mackerel. Yeah. That's, that is, I mean, how many episodes of, of next generation do you remember where they're actually shot scenes on, you know, in a real location, right. um, not on a set. I, there can't be many. No, there's um, a, you know there's a couple where they're in Bronson Canyon or something like that. You know, like for Darmok, mm -hmm. you know, some park in L.A. But yeah, you're right. Right, right. But no, not only was it shot on location, but it was shot on location of a place that was actually the place it was supposed to be. Yeah, it was a vineyard. You know, they went to a vineyard. I mean, because they're in California, so probably there was uh, you know 500 vineyards within you know a 50 mile radius <laughs> that they could go to, um, and said, okay, this is France, but. Um, uh, it was it was fantastic and it looked so nice and the and the, uh, the sound mixing was great because you got actual sounds of the wind in the trees and you got birds. I mean, some of that was probably um, special effects, but still, it actually felt like you know wine country in California or in France. Yeah, um, and one of, and that was lovely. One of the classic uh, matte paintings too that they just don't really do anymore uh, for TV shows, uh, but you know as they pull out and we see the countryside surrounding um, the vineyard. Uh, and you, it's, you know, one of those mm -hmm. classic matte paintings that it's become a lost art. Yeah. I made a note of that too. I was, I was very impressed with that. Um, not only did they take care to show the manor house, well, it wasn't the manor house, it's just a house, but that, that, that classical, you know, farmhouse sort of in the middle foreground, but then in the distant background were these, you know, antennas or power stations or some, you know, 23rd century 
gigaw yeah. that had been <laughs> you know, part of the landscape. <laughs> it's just, yeah, it's just here. It's just been here for a long sure. time. It also shows you that it's not uh, like a horrible, dystopic, uh, Blade Runner-esque, you know, uh, arcology-laden no, future. No. And, and also, I mean, the, 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 the other thing I liked about that whole aspect of it, what you were just saying about what's it like to be a person in, in, on Earth at this time, um, is Robert was out there, you know, feeling up the grapes, man. Right. <laughs> um, you know, tasting them and checking them. And he wasn't out there with a tricorder. Yeah. And, and he had this sort of not, I wouldn't say entirely, and it, it, he had an antipathy towards technology, yeah. but it was in a, a very understandable way. It was part of his, his family's tradition. And you would imagine that there were probably a lot of other people not maybe not. Okay. Let me rephrase that. Not a lot of other people, but there were other people who had similar lives to what he had. The whole thing, the conversation they kept having about Cynthia Hall. I loved that. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, him, him just sort of ripping on Cynthia Hall. Like I, I'm sure that was a Roddenberry concept. I'm positive it was. And I always hated it <laughs> because, you know, what, what is the point of this? Right. Yeah. You get a little bit of a buzz, but then you can say, no, I don't want to be buzzed anymore. And it's like, well, uh, take away something from the whole plot. I don't know. Well, yeah, And also just the, the way that it cuts into the fact that, you know, Robert it grows wine and it's tied into their family history and the way that he keeps sort of, uh, uh, plugging away at uh, Picard with how he wants to be in control. And if you want yeah. to, um, you know, if you want to drink and you want to do something with your life and, you know, have fun or whatever it is, you you put yourself in a position where you might be out of control and that might be something that's good for you. And whereas you just want to sit here and drink your synthahol, you know, which is garbage and never lose control. And you you can't live your life like that. Let's, let's uh, bust into the Robert uh, Jean Luc relationship. Sure. What, what did you think of that? What did you? How did you? How did you feel about that? Well, with this being the only time that we ever see them, and then of course we learn of their untimely deaths in generations. Um, okay, we can come back to that later. I have I have a beef. Okay, but go ahead. Well, it's hard to parse, and what I liked about it is, like we said before, like the Crusher um, sort of story is kind of cute. Uh, and touching the uh, wharf story is a little more complicated in that he is, you know, a, a child who's a different species and it's a weird setup, but they all love each other anyway. And then you've got the Picard family and it's like, but the thing I got out of it was like, sometimes being screwed up is exactly right. Like sometimes that's what you need. Like we have this weird mm -hmm. antagonistic relationship which you don't you think is going to be a big problem and, and is not going to it's not very nurturing, but maybe that's just what you need to hear at the right time. Like dysfunction is function sometimes in families. Well, um, you know, uh, a friend of mine one time put it that a family is defined by the secrets that they keep. Hmm. Um, and, and the thing I like about uh, Robert is, is that Robert doesn't believe in secrets. Robert just tells you what he thinks. Yeah. You know, you know, oh, Jean Luc, guess what? I never liked you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> guess what? I like bullying you sometimes. Guess what? It was a pain in the ass being your older brother because you were so goddamn perfect. Yeah. And, and, and th th there, there's no secrets there. The secrets are actually Picard's. Yeah. Picard is the one who's keeping the secrets here. He's the one who's saying, no, 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 I didn't raise my arms in victory. Oh, yes, you did, Jean-Luc. Of course you did. <laughs> right. You know, how could you not? Because that's really who you are. I mean, and, that, and we're not holding that against you. That was who you were when you were 18. And now you're, I don't know, whatever he is, 40 or 50. Or, you know, you've matured. Yeah, right. But don't deny your past. Yeah. You know, don't deny who you were. You probably were unbearable um, in some shape or form <laughs> when you were younger and had more hair and, you know, were irresistible to everyone around you. Yeah. Um, yeah. Can you imagine being his brother? I can't. That'd be rough. <laughs> It'd be really yeah. rough. So I loved their relationship. I loved how, I loved how Robert just didn't cut him any slack yeah. at all. I should mention I have two brothers. Oh, okay. Well, there you, you go. Know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you don't, you don't ever, ever, ever. I mean, you love them and you, you know, 
you hope that you you're you're doing well by them. But oh my God, you know, you never cut them in slack. No. You can't because <laughs> they never give you any. Right. Uh, we haven't even really mentioned uh, Sir Patrick Stewart's performance as uh, Captain Picard in this episode. And it, the whole thing is hung on him. I mean, the fact that you can have an episode of a sci-fi TV series that, let's face it, has no explosions or aliens outside of Worf. It's just the story of a man coming to terms with something horrible that happened to him. No offense to the rest of the TNG cast, but it's hard to imagine a story like this working with any of the other actors or characters on the show. Um, and a, I'm actually going to go back to a comment I made earlier when we were talking about um, the uh, Worf and his parents, mm-hmm. that the first scene that they were in, they came across as a little bit, I don't know, uh, dialed up a little too high. But then I, I, I settled into their rhythm. Mm-hmm. Similarly, and, and it's been a while since I've watched an episode of Next Generation. I, I, I you know, it's on Netflix, so I, I throw one on every once in a while just to kind of have it in the background. But to really sit and watch one, it's been a while. Mm-hmm. Um, probably The Wounded, the last time we talked. Yeah, right. Um, and, and turning this on and, and watching it, the first couple of scenes, especially the scenes with um, Picard and Troy, it was kind of actually a thrill, like, oh, wow, they're really overplaying this. Oh, my God. <laughs> they're just, everything is just very arch, and uh, it almost is like they're playing to the cheap seats here. Well, yeah. Um, but then again, you settle it, or I settled into sort of the tone and the rhythm of the story, and then I realized, oh, wait, no, Picard is doing... He's giving a master class here on TV acting. Yeah. How, you know, the nuances, the, um, you know, the subtle little uh, tonal inflection. And I don't know why. And again, we know these things are not filmed sequentially, but he got better and better as the story goes along. Uh-huh. Uh, until, until by the end of it, um, he was giving almost a naturalistic, very low... Um, fi, low fidelity performance. I mean, I mean the scene where he there's all, all throughout he's he's doing really good work, but then the I think the last two or three scenes that he's in, um, the scene with him and his brother having the fight, which is by the way one of the great all time middle aged guy fights ever. <laughs> Yeah. You know, like oh, you know, I mean Picard knows how to fight. He's like he's been in fights before. He's probably. You know, and, and his brother is probably also a pretty, you know, fit guy. Right. They weren't really trying to hurt each other. They were just trying to, like, mess each other up a little bit. Right. Um, and uh, it just was a great... It, 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 whoever blocked it with him, whoever helped them figure out this is what we're going to do, fantastic job, guys. Yeah. It was... It, it felt real. It felt authentic. Um you know, nobody was really, really trying to hurt each other. Though that first punch that Picard laid on Robert, that must have hurt. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> and and but then the but then the the scene where he breaks down is amazing. Yeah. It's so well done. This is actually the lowest rated episode of the fourth season, uh, which I think is crazy. When like, how do you go through? the entire uh, saga of best of both worlds. And you live through that cliffhanger that we all remember uh, until the show came back. And then you go, well, I don't care what comes after that. <laughs> I mean, I remember as a kid, I didn't consciously care uh, when I was watching TNG uh, as a younger person about family drama or character development. But I remembered seeing the next time on Star Trek uh, with the scenes from family and thinking, well, Eating soup and wrestling in a vineyard doesn't seem as cool as fighting zombie cyborgs, but yeah, we should probably see what Picard thought of all that. You said this was first broadcast on October 1st, 1990? That's correct. All right, I'm looking to see what else was on that that day. And there's nothing that like was <laughs> like outstanding. You know, MacGyver, you know, that's always good. Sure. Uh, Monday Night Football, sure, but eh, who cares? <laughs> I don't see anything else here that would have made me go, nope, I'd rather watch Murphy Brown than um, right. Star Trek. 
Was it like a pennant game or something? No, no, nothing like that at all. I think people saw overalls and mud fights and they were like, oh, I could probably skip this one. No, no lasers or phasers. Right, yeah, yeah. And no, uh, no spaceships. I don't know. That, I don't remember. I mean, I remember watching this one yeah. when it first came on, 1990. Um, I, I remember it very well because it was one of the ones that I was, I was very impressed with it. Um, and it was so odd and unusual, and I mean, that's part of the reason why we're talking about it here. I, that's why I remember it. It was so out of the ordinary. Um, and it was the beginning of a really good run. I mean, the third season was, was strong. There was a lot of good stuff in it. The Klingon stuff was excellent. Yeah. But the fourth season and the fifth season, that was a real run. They just, they, not, there's not really a bad one. The, the, the scenes with Picard and his brother, the, the breakdown that he has, and then Robert kind of explaining to him why are you why you're here? You came home because, and he had this all figured out. And I don't know if he's the kind of a character that you could say he had this whole thing planned out from the beginning. I'm going to get into a fight with my brother so that he has an epiphany. I don't think he's that kind of guy. No. He's the kind of guy who kind of goes moment by moment and is looking. It's not exactly for an opportunity to do something good, but to do something well. Hmm. And he found his moment, and then he was like, "Okay, you know, I'm I'm going to do something here." And it's and 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 the way he defined it was, "This is what I've been doing our whole lives. I mean, you've been gone for the last twenty years, yet yeah, now having adventures and saving the universe and blah 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 blah. <laughs> that this is what you and I have always done." I've always taken care of you and to have Picard kind of go, okay, it is amazing. Yeah. I, 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 to have, have, uh, um, Patrick Stewart sell that moment without it being this, you know, grand epiphany. I thought it was, was lovely. So that was my, that was, that was my last comment about, uh, the, the, the uh, his acting. But if you have other things that you'd like to say, please feel free. <laughs> Well, no, I was just going to open it up. Now that we've reached the end of the show, did you have any sort of last thoughts about the episode that you wanted to get in? Yes. God damn them for killing Renee and Robert. <laughs> and that was Ronald D. Moore. I know. Yeah. And I, I, I and uh, was Braga part of that yes. story too? Yes. I think that he, yeah. So, I mean, those guys wrote some really good stuff together. They wrote some good stuff separately. Um, I feel like it was, I mean, that was, that's, cheap storytelling. I feel like it just, you, you, there were a lot of different things that they could have done with that story to put the card. I mean, because we're, we're talking about generations here That's and, correct. and you know, it was, it was important to bring the card to a low point so that he could have, you know, his, his, um, rising and advancing his, his epiphany, something, you know, he would like feel like I can continue from this low point, uh, he had to have an arc. Yeah. But killing both of those characters, um, felt cheap. I just didn't like it. I, I, I didn't, I didn't think it was a good, I, I don't think it was a good choice. There were a lot of other things they could have done to Picard to bring him low and not resort to, which I think what I think it really was, is kind of cheap sentimentality. You know, oh, we're going to kill this boy and his father, who are the only living blood relatives that he had. You couldn't have come up with something better than that. You couldn't have come up. I mean, there were probably a, I, one or the other would have been good. Um, I don't know. I, I, I just I, I just uh, Generations is a movie. I know a lot of people have a lot of strong opinions about yeah. for good and for it's a movie I actually kind of like mm -hmm. overall. But I hate that. So there, there. That's my that's that's my last. That's the last thing I'd written down. That um, yeah, goddamn for what they did to Robert and Robert. Uh, oh, also, also, Robert is kind of a prig. He is what we would be. He would probably be if in this modern world. If he were in this era of ours, he would be a um, he would be a conservative, and he would live. Uh, in a community of, um, I don't know. He wouldn't. He wouldn't. He would probably watch Fox TV. Maybe <laughs> I don't know. Maybe I'm going too far there. But 
he he would not be like somebody I probably if he lived in my neighborhood that I would talk to. Yeah. Um but he'd probably have a great like uh garden. So I always admire a guy with a great garden, <laughs> right? He would be I think I I love your comment about uh, him being conservative. I think he would be a conservative, but it would be that person that it's like I want to hate this guy because we have different uh, political beliefs, but He's I feel like he's on the up and up like in the episode. Yeah, he he loves Marie. He is doting on her, you know, and he seems to be by all accounts, a good husband and father. Their relationship, the the both of the between him and his wife and him and his son are fantastic. You never get the sense that the boy that uh, Renee is, you know, wary of his dad. He feels completely comfortable saying, oh, I'm going to go be a starship captain. Right. Yeah. And he is not. He's not at all anxious that his father is going to say, no, you're not. Right. You know, he's, he's, he trusts him completely, which is fantastic. And, uh, um, and I agree with you, the relationship that he has with Marie, I mean, however it was those actors decided, oh, we're going to do this and we're going to have this little interaction together. Fantastic. Yeah. One last comment. Marie's outfits were Amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they were nice. <laughs> they were they were always like they were always I mean they they looked like something you would wear on a farm, except they were purple right. and pink <laughs> and <laughs> like it was they were great. You know, yeah. it was like miracle fabrics, but very conservative and um yeah. So, go ahead. Your last closing thoughts on this one. Uh, I, well, I think I've made uh, myself clear. I, I just think that anybody who's a fan of seeing human drama against the backdrop of Trek, which should be just about everybody, uh, should really love it. And I always like to see um, the fleeting glimpses that we get of, of non-Starfleet business and life in Star Trek. It seems to be so rare. And, and, and again, I will say compliments to everybody who decided we need to do this story. We need it. We need the breath before the plunge. Yeah. Which I am a big fan of. I, 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 I'm sorry. I wrote two things down at the top of my tab when I, was, when I was starting to take notes. The first one was PTSD, and the second one was epilogues. And I'm a fan of epilogues. I think every book I've written, if not, maybe not everyone, but most of them, I love an epilogue. Huh. I love saying, okay. That stuff all happened. Right. Now let's 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 just have a moment. How do we feel here. about that? Yeah, you know, <laughs> uh, yeah. Just just like let's just let's just take a breath here, and let's just show you a little bit. Time has passed. Everybody's kind of had time to absorb these these experiences. Where are we now? And I love I love books that do that. I love stories that do that. I love movies that do that. And um, wow. I will always, if I if I have the opportunity, put an epilogue in because I think it gives it that nice rounded feeling of not reality because it's fiction. Yeah. But like these people have lives beyond the climax of the story. Yeah. And right. I am, you know, hopefully going to be able to give you a little bit more about them. And I, I, I feel like that's really strong. So as an epilogue, I think this is an excellent story in and of itself. But the fact that they decided, okay, we're going to give this little little bit of business over here. There you go. Yeah. Fantastic. I like that too. The last time you were on the show, you named Kirk as your favorite captain, despite his reactionary jingoistic dickheadedishness. Uh, your words. Uh, could you see yes. Kirk in a situation like family, perhaps after, I don't know, defeating the creature in obsession or putting his, putting the finger on Kodos. Uh, could you see Kirk in a situation like this? No, I can't. I mean, I can imagine Kirk, maybe going off with bones and having, you know, kind of a, a pub crawl. <laughs> sure. Or, um, you know, uh, it depends on which version of Kirk we're talking about, but let's just stick with the, the Shatner yeah, version. Shatner. I can imagine him going off and hooking up, and I don't mean that in a bad way, but like, you know, an old girlfriend, an old lover, and having this kind of, like, moment um, but going well, for one thing, his brother's dead. But yeah, right, no brother. <laughs> the the uh, no, I can't. I can't see him having that kind of a. Uh, I screwed up, or I, you know, I feel like I was a failure, and it almost costs, you know, 
it cost me, it may have cost me my soul. I am, I am laid low. I mean, we know that after Spock died at the end of Wrath of Khan, that he was in a bad state for a while. But did I ever feel like he was in danger of quitting Starfleet? No, right. it's never, never, right. never. Right. His, 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 his um, motivation is to go solve the next problem. Right. Yeah. Whatever that is. Uh, so no. Um, and that's great. That's fine. They're different characters. They're fundamentally and, 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 and to their benefit of both of them, different characters. So no, I can't say I could see, could you see group doing that? Uh, something like that? Um, I think, you know, if somebody wants to write a story like that, I would definitely read it, but I think there's too much of that sort of, um, sixties kind of Kennedy's don't cry type, uh, thing going on where you're right. I, ah, I don't, I don't think a character ah. uh, of that time could introspect like that. It would just be sort of, you know, very well burdens of command onto the next thing. Uh, yeah. And, you know, I mean, at the worst of it, uh, you wouldn't do that in a way that you would have like kind of a breakdown. Oh, you would no, be like, no. again, you would, you would have like, I mean, I think the pub call with bones is actually a pretty good, I would write that story. Um, you know, we're in the middle of, you know, uh, you know, you have a fight with a couple of punks in the back alley behind the, the pub. And then, you know, you have this little, you make this comment about, you know, all we've lost you know, something, some macho. I mean, come on, let's face it. Kirk, Kirk's pretty goddamn macho. He's, macho. <laughs> he's never, he's never gonna, um, let that completely slip by. He's going to be the guy who's going to like, just <sighs> everything. You know, he's going to be the guy who's going to die of congestive heart failure because he's not allowed to ever. <laughs> right. Just holding it in. <laughs> Have a real emotion. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, anyway, that's, yeah, that's a good question. I like that. That's a really, that's a good idea. For appearing on the show a second time, you receive a promotion from the rank of ensign to lieutenant junior grade. Now you were assigned previously mm. to the bioengineering department. Did you ever manage to figure out what happened in bioengineering? We engineer biologists, I think. Okay. Or we, <laughs> we, we breed engineers, uh, one or the other, sure. maybe both. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, 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 yeah. I don't actually go to work that often. Um, it doesn't seem to matter. They pay me anyway. Well, they don't pay me. I mean, I'm allowed to go get food from the, uh, replicator and I get clothes and you know, it seems <laughs> to be okay. It's cool. Nobody seems to mind. Yeah. I think I found um, a problem with the uh, economy of the 24th century. <laughs> Yes, yes, yes. Well, let's talk about that next time. <laughs> there's my next. There's my next novel. Is is econ the Economist uh, 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 as protagonist in the Star Trek universe? I would just go to town on that. You would totally need that because even though the Federation or or Earth doesn't use currency, they're still dealing with other races that do. The whole point is to contact other races, right? And so you would need a ton of like exo economists to to be ready to figure out other people's currencies and, and uh, economies. Okay, let's just let's just be clear here right now. Nobody grows grapes and makes wine because they're not getting paid for it. <laughs> yeah. Nobody cares that a particular vintage, the 47, is better or worse than the 46 unless somebody is willing to pay more for one or the other. The whole concept of uh, having no currency completely falls apart in the face of artisanal um, uh, uh, cuisine right. or anything like that. Right. Yeah, yeah. You can imagine that only anybody would ever have synthesol. Synthesol, sure, like that. But you would not have a vineyard of the quality that apparently the Picard vineyard is without it somehow being, you know, to the benefit of those people. Now, if you can explain to me the econ the economics of <laughs> somebody creating that wine but not being compensated in some way for it that would be that there there's an assignment go for it okay i'll, <laughs> I'll jump right on that <laughs> <laughs> yeah no it's it's silly but there you go it was gene's idea well lieutenant lang thanks for joining me to talk about star trek and the star trek universe if people want to continue the conversation they can at at eist pod on twitter and the enterprising individuals facebook page now i know that you're not a social media guy but if people want to keep up with you online where can they go uh i'm not a social media guy so therefore they probably can't <laughs> do you have anything uh, that you're working on coming up that you want to talk about 
Uh, I'm, I'm hopefully finishing the rough draft of a book that I've been working on for a year. I keep saying that it's almost finished and I hope it's almost finished. Um, and then it's off to the, to the, to the, to the next stage of, Oh God, let's go find somebody who wants to publish this. Okay. It's not, a, it's not a Star Trek okay. thing. It's an original. Sure. Um, but, uh, I hope I have great hopes for it. So, um, we'll see. It's been, it's, it, I just, I just, I just passed page 500 um, yesterday, so I'm like, oh, God, please let this be over soon. <laughs> so does my wife. My wife is like, please let this be over soon. <laughs> so we'll see. Well, good luck with that. Thank you. And and let me thank you again for uh, inviting me on. This is always, as always, or, or, as it was before, it's tremendous fun. I love, love talking about this Absolutely. stuff. So thank you. Yeah, thanks again for joining me. And we're signing off until the next mission, Hailing Frequencies Closed. It's on your mind.